Hi. So this practice uh, sessions, or the whole session, but especially the formal practices, you can do them lying down, sitting, standing if that's comfortable. Um, they'll probably be like two 10, 12 minute sessions. So it'll be, it'll be shorter. So you can just tune in to see what your body wants and needs, what supports uh, wakefulness and easefulness. Um, similarly, cameras on or off, eyes opened or closed. So easily we get into habits of like, here's how I always practice. But it can be helpful to do that extra layer of checking in. What's true right now? What's needed right now? I Walt. Hey. So, um, I'm going to start with this three sounds of a bell. Uh, some of you that's familiar, some of you that's not a familiar practice. And it's just a chance to practice listening meditation, really. Hearing the sounds. Um, if the sound of a bell can be challenging for you, I am going to try and sound it lightly and gently. Um, but also know you might want to just turn the volume down for a moment or two or you turn your head away from the speaker if that's supportive for you. Welcome to those just joining. We're going to do a shorter practice period. And right now, however things are, whether you've just rushed in from somewhere or uh, you're digesting dinner, feeling a little sleepy, whatever the state is right now, can we open to just receive this moment's experience, all the sensations? the thoughts and emotions, the sounds that we're hearing around us and inside of us. Not needing to change it, not needing to fix anything. Starting by opening. Sometimes I almost imagine a flower opening this like up and out, letting attention be spacious. And then it might want to settle awareness into the contact of body and ground. Whatever surface is supporting is holding us up. into the personal specific experience of pressure and temperature, but also it's a shared experience of earth holding all our bodies. And can we let ourselves be held just a little more? go of any extra effort, just 
just a little more. Softening muscles and uh, softening effort just a little more. Along with this opening and softening and resting, we also invite a little more curiosity, a little more interest, a little more joyful energy or uh, easeful energy. And maybe that's resting in the contact touch points, maybe resting in the expression and experience of breathing, if that's where you're familiar. And maybe resting in the movement of sound. You choose an anchor. So bit by bit, we collect our attention, we collect the broad field of awareness into this anchor without having to force things out, without having to strive, without extra effort. Just finding enough to be interested, alert, as everything changes bit by bit. For the last few minutes, tuning in to see if there's a bit of a sense of a, a hum, a vibration, an aliveness. There may or may not be. <laughs> Sometimes flowing through all these arising and passing sensations and thoughts and sounds. There's this hum, this pulse, this 
sense of being alive. And all of this is happening within the larger field of awareness that goes beyond a separate individual self and is bigger than all the phenomena that arise and fades away. So an invitation just to tune into this aliveness within the larger field of awareness. to close this formal practice I'm going to sound the bell twice And still, you may want to bring movement back into your body, or you may not. If your eyes have been closed, you may want to bring sight back in, and you may not. Really invite you to tune in and see, do you want to do more of a contemplative listening where you're still, you're still continuing the practice in a pretty similar way, and just letting these words pass through awareness. And you might be really happy to or be more engaged and moving around a bit and have your screen on your eyes open so you can play in and out of all these modes and also no need to stay perfectly still uh, no need to be sitting up please really tend tend to your needs and hello cat <laughs> I'm glad to have pets present too so my name is Melina Bondi pronouns are they and them. I am a white, queer, gender fluid Dharma practitioner and teacher or sharer of meditation and Dharma practices. I live in Tuckeranto, which is the traditional name, original name of what is colonially known as Toronto. Um, and it's an honor to get to share with you and be with you tonight. I had been a monastic in the Plum Village tradition for, well, I was ordained for nine years. I lived in the monasteries for six years. And so tonight's sharing comes very much through Plum Village practice, but I'm also rooted in insight or, I don't know, Western Vipassana, some people call it, um, with one of my teachers, Jill Davy here. A friend peer on the path as well as guide and the True North Insight community is one of the places where where I find home and I'm also currently studying with Tanissa and Kidasaro, um, so who some of you know and they're also really shaping my practice deeply. Um, so tonight I want to share on queering the precepts uh, in general and queering the third precept in particular. Um, I'm not 
super adept at all sorts of theories, <laughs> but, but, um, but using the word queering in the sense of blurring bi binaries, questioning assumptions, roles, identities and standards that specifically comes out of um, queer, trans, sexual and gender folks who are outside of cishet norms, but it's also a, sort of a movement and a thought and a way of being that um, that considers or interprets things that rejects traditional categories. That's blurring. And you know, in the Dharma, we're we're always looking to move beyond non dual beyond dualities, which are binaries. So I think there's something inherently very queer in the Dharma. Um, but it's especially when we talk about things like sex, sexuality, gender, the Dharma can be so binary and so deeply conservative in some of its expressions. So I felt it was really important to be one voice, hopefully amongst many who are sharing things that don't get often, don't get shared often. So I'm not, you know, giving a perfect, complete, 100% authoritative kind of interpretation, but I'm sharing from a, an engaged practice uh, of a few decades that has taken many forms, lay and monastic. Um, so I know some of you may be familiar and others you, of you may not be familiar that in the Plum Village tradition, they take what are traditionally called the precepts, the third precept being, I undertake the precept to refrain from sexual misconduct. Of course, the million dollar question is what on earth is meant by sexual misconduct? Um, but all of the tr precepts in the Plum Village tradition get turned into these whole paragraphs. And I'm gonna see if I can put this the Plum Village version into the chat for everyone. Yes, I can do that. Mm, but I have to make it shorter so that um, can read it together. And then I'll just share a bunch of reflections and stories of how not only have I practiced with it, but how my practice has changed with it over the decades. Um, because I think ultimately that's, that's how we need to practice with everything, especially precepts, um, if they stay fixed, and if we're just looking at the form, um, we're gonna, it's gonna be hard to catch the spirit. Um, and our lives change the conditions and causes that we uh, experience change. So how could practicing ethical trainings um, not change in their form? So in the Plum Village tradition, this precept becomes a mindfulness training Aware of the suffering caused by sexual misconduct, I am committed to cultivating responsibility and learning ways to protect the safety and integrity of individuals, couples, families, and society. Knowing that sexual desire is not love and that sexual activity motivated by craving always harms myself as well as others, I am determined not to engage in sexual relations without mutual consent, true love, and a deep long-term commitment. I resolve to find spiritual support for the integrity of my relationship from family members, friends, and Sangha with whom there is support and trust. I will do everything in my power to protect children from sexual abuse and to prevent couples and families from being broken by sexual misconduct. Seeing that body and mind are interrelated, I am committed to learning appropriate ways to take care of my sexual energy and to cultivate the four basic elements of true love, loving kindness, compassion, joy, and inclusiveness for the greater happiness of myself and others. Recognizing the diversity of human experience, I am committed not to discriminate against any form of gender identity or sexual orientation. Practicing true love, we know that we will continue beautifully into the future. So that's actually the most recent update. Just this past summer, 
last summer, last summer, um, they added this phrase at the end about um, committing not to discriminate against any form of gender identity or sexual orientation. And that came through a whole sort of movement in the community of, of folks requesting and kind of petitioning to put that in there. And, and the change happened, which um, I was really moved by. And, um, and I can say, and when I first read these, they were a different ver version. Um, and there's so much in it that moved me, but then this little piece about, I'm determined not to engage in sexual relationships without mutual consent, true love, and a deep long-term commitment. At the time it said, made known to family and friends. And I first remember going, well, clearly there are no queer people in this community because that's not even safe to do in a lot of parts of the world. And I just assumed that there was going to be like, um, yeah, that there wasn't going to be room and space for me. And I was quite turned off. Um, but I was so drawn in to everything else by, by Thich Nhat Hanh. Eventually I went on a retreat and was in a conversation with some folks who, who shared with me that, that the way, one way to approach these trainings is to look at the first sentence as the core and then everything else is commentary. So this first sentence of a, where is suffering caused by sexual misconduct, still gonna get back to what that even means. I'm committed to cultivating responsibility and learning ways to protect safety and integrity of individuals, couples, families, and society. Um, and especially the piece about like the true love of the loving kindness, the compassion, the joy and inclusivity or equanimity that just spoke to my heart so deeply and everything else spoke to my heart very deeply. And so I had the chance to take, uh, to receive formally these trainings in a ceremony um, with Thich Nhat Hanh in 2005 at Deer Park Monastery in California. There's like 150 of us receiving the trainings in this ceremony, about eight or 900 people in the room together. And it was really powerful. Um, I really felt myself energetically step into or sort of be swept into this line and stream of practitioners spanning back 2,600 years. Um, and I think that that softened some of my discomfort with some of the wording, the, the power of the ceremonial experience. Um, but also I was really grateful to a number of folks who were able to, to repeat this idea of, uh, you know, if you're interested in practicing with the trainings, don't change all your behaviors. Get really curious about where suffering happens, <laughs> what causes it, and what supports it to fade away. And if after really examining your own motivations, your impulses, your habits, you're really clear on how it all happens at some point, you'll probably want to change some things. Um, and I found that really helpful and not everyone teaches them in that way. Um, but it was deeply uh, meaningful for me because I didn't want to have to take on all these roles, <laughs> but I really wanted to engage. And this helped me get in touch with the spirit of looking at my own life. Um, it got me to quit, using any alcohol or drugs, which I hadn't done much of. So I didn't even think that I needed to quit. <laughs> but then I looked at why I was doing it and I did not like any of my reasons. And then it wasn't a rule imposed from the outside. It was like, oh, I don't have to do this thing that I don't even like. I'm really glad that I looked at that. And so sexually, um, I was thinking like, does this mean that I can't have casual sex? Cause I was polyamorous and pansexual and already knew I was gender fluid, although it wasn't really talked about 25 years ago. Um, and I have had really hell healing, beautiful experiences of casual sex. Um, and I was, I was like, I think part of my heart just always felt like, I don't think there's anything wrong here and I'm not going to condemn this just because some 
list of rules says you shouldn't do this, but I got really curious. And that was helpful. Um, so this whole first sort of wave of practicing with this precept, this training, um, was really exploring this sort of core aspect of what causes harm and suffering, what relieves it. Um, and I know, and then eventually I realized like, oh, if I don't know someone well enough to know if casual sex is actually a good idea for them or a trauma response, ah, I think I actually do want to refrain on really casual sex. For myself, that to, not to you know assume that I'm going to make decisions for other people and that they can't make their own decisions. But I realized, you know, there were some boundaries that I actually wanted to take because of my own reflections, because of being really moved by this possibility of causing less harm for myself and others. Um, and then maybe four or five years later, three, four years later, um, I was in a long-term relationship with one person, started off more actively poly. And on our first date, I had said, so, you know, my primary relationship is with the Dharma. It takes a large space in my life. It's a very active relationship. And she was partnered with someone else. So I was like, perfect. We both have. <laughs> um, other active relationships and the Dharma still stays central in my life, but eventually her other relationship um, ended. And so for a while we were in this looking like a monogamous relationship, long-term living together, kind of looked like more typically what um, this precept was suggesting, you know, family and friends knew about us. Um, and then, and so I was, you know, just thinking about how to cultivate love in a, in a long-term relationship. And then the inner call to ordain came and, um, and it stayed. And eventually I realized I knew I needed to, to go follow it. And I was terrified and agonizing over breaking my partner's heart. Much more, I was so much more concerned about her than, than myself. And so I actually turned to all the trainings. I was like reading them every night, just going like, oh my God, what do I do? How do I do this? I don't know how to do this. Maybe I just, maybe I won't. Maybe I'll stay in the relationship because the thought of breaking up was so painful. I had always been the one who was dumped in the past and it had hurt so much. I think something in me just like couldn't imagine myself being the one to dump someone else. And it was actually in large part through reading and rereading and rereading these trainings and eventually that spirit of cultivating true love. It's like, oh, pretending to be in love with someone when actually I wanna leave, that's not true love. And so it wasn't so much the, the, the rule of the training, but getting into that deeper spirit like what's, what's not just what to not do, but what am I trying to develop through the whole practice of the Dharma? What, are, what kind of heart am I trying to grow? That it actually really helped me to eventually break up <laughs> and leave. And it was still, you know, agonizing. And it also really pointed out that even if you're in a relationship that looks like the kind that the precepts are suggesting, you're still going to hurt each other. They're still going to be suffering, <laughs> um, which is not a reason to not engage, right? And and this is a lesson in all the precepts, all the trainings. They are. This is not about perfection. You can't do it all right. You can't not cause harm, but how can we cause less harm? And and so that was sort of like my second big phase of being really committed to these trainings in a moment where like there was no way to not cause a lot of harm. And that was so important. And every time I would come back to them, it would just kind of give me a little bit more of an anchor, a little bit more sense of, of ground when everything else felt very ungrounded and, and disorienting and very scary. Um, and also a lot of like, 
a lot of self focus, overly thinking about myself and taking myself too seriously. And there's a lot going on there. Um, so these provided me with this grounding that I really, really cherished and still cherish. And then my third phase, um, if we're going to see these in phases of practice, was becoming a monastic and taking on celibacy by choice, um, taking on quite joyfully. Uh, I had had a lovely, full, rich sexual life and I knew what I was giving up, did so willingly and gladly. Not because I ever thought that there was anything wrong with sex, sexuality, physical intimacy, um, but I was just so excited to get to put all my life energy into cultivating Dharma practices and to live in a community where that's what we were all doing. Um, not that it was easy. <laughs> it wasn't quiet and peaceful. It was challenging. Um, I spent about four years in Plum Village and a little over uh, like two, three years in Blue Cliff Monastery in New York State. Um, and in the monastic container, there are a lot of teachings about how sexual, you know, sexual engagement. I mean, it actually, if you do have sex, you have broken your vows and you're kicked out of the community. Um, there are teachings around how to overcome sexual desire. And the Buddha suggested things like imagining the hairs and the nails of the, the person <laughs> that you're attracted to, imagining their bodies decomposing. Imagining the flesh under, or like the, the muscles under under the skin, um, kind of gory stuff. And I tried those. I found them incredibly unhelpful. Um, I, I just, A, I couldn't stick with the visualization well enough. And then I was just like, it didn't do anything when I was <laughs> back around the folks I was attracted to. And I had a, one in particular, very strong crush um, just before I ordained. And because I had, you know, I had left a partnership, I was making this commitment. I was really excited about the path. And yet suddenly there's this like tremendous desire uh, that I really chose to turn towards it and practice with it really actively. And I found that for myself, there were these like sort of three main aspects. One was like physically like desire in the body, which had always sort of been this like thing that I thought of as fun. <laughs> but when I really stayed with the sensations in my body and all the thoughts and the impulses, I was like, oh my gosh, there's so much sensation and there's such a sense of like, what do I do with it? It was incredibly painful. Um, deep, which surprised me to no end. And so then I started just practicing body scans with it. My knees feeling melty, lots of like tingling in my genitals or in like spinal, like you know, arm kind of twitchiness, all of that. And there's so much energy. Um, but because I was in this process of making this really big commitment, I had enough, um, I guess, motivation to really stay with the energy. And within a few days, it would it passed. And I started to even get a little excited about when it came up because I was like, oh my gosh, this is so different than how I experienced it in the past. Um, and bits of it were pleasant if I, if, it, if I wasn't trying to like figure out what to do with it. And if all the old patterns of like, oh my gosh, I'm going to get rejected. And oh my gosh, what's going to happen? I can't do, you know, all the stories about it. If those could get put aside and I could just be with the raw sensations, it was fascinating. Um... And I still use that to this day. And then there's a whole other layer that I sort of energetically found, um, usually co-arising, but it's really its own thing, which was times of really wanting attention. Um, and it's deeply human <laughs> to want connection and attention and, and to feel special and to feel recognized and, um, and that became a really profound, and I started noticing it, you know, repeatedly, like, oh, look, oh yeah, I remember that time um, in this one particular crush. But then I started looking at it 
any time that some, you know, attraction was coming up and I could start to feel like almost coming out of the center of my belly, this like hand that was like, wanting, like I want attention. I want your attention. <laughs> um, and again, I feel like in a lot of the Dharma teachings, there can be almost this um, flavor of really um, kind of criticizing desires and and things like oh you're just wanting attention uh also we hear that outside of dharma settings and again when i was like oh it's it's just wanting attention let's just put that aside because that's not worthy or that's not important or that's going to distract that didn't do any good (laughs) but really bringing this kindness and compassion to go like oh part of me wants attention What's deprived from attention? How am I not getting enough attention with my friends? Or am I giving myself enough attention? And as soon as I turned it around into what care is needed? Where, what part of me is feeling depleted or isolated or just really sad about other things? Um, very quickly that, that reaching and wanting from someone else just again, like kind of dissipated. Um, it required very active engagement of like having dates with myself, <laughs> of, you know, like taking myself to the orchard and, you know, cause I couldn't go out. We didn't, <laughs> we couldn't um, do that kind of personal date, but you know, like taking my journal and the hammock to the orchard and just saying, I'm going to give myself lots of attention. Um, for this afternoon and just do whatever is enjoyable and um, we would call these lazy days every Monday had no schedule and so like but then it'd be easy to get caught up in too many other things but to really just have this intention of giving myself attention or reaching out to friends and saying hey you know I I want some company like (laughs) You have tea with me, we go for a walk with me, and and there's some vulnerability in that. Um, But it was remarkable how that consistently really took care of that, the craving, the clingy, the graspy, tight part of, I want attention from you. Um, And then there was this other aspect that just surprised and delighted me that when I was doing okay with all the sensations and not caught up in like the papancha, the, the thought proliferation that, that would go along with it. And when I was getting enough attention for myself and from friends, then when desire and attraction arose, I was able to find this other energy that was the pure appreciation of beauty. I was like, wow, there's, there's someone that I've just met who's like, really gorgeous <laughs> and and being around them is is resonating and activating deep appreciation and wow this is this is wonderful <laughs> and it started to become this doorway into a metta a loving kindness practice that's kind of combined with mudita the sympathetic joy and kind of other things but um but largely metta And I started, I remember one day specifically when like this sort of dawned on me as a practice, we were sitting in a discussion circle. Um, I was sitting next, I was like trying to avoid the person I had this crush on. She sat down next to me. I was like, oh, but I was okay. Like let the sensations come and okay, they settled. And then the like, oh yeah, that part of me that wants attention. Okay. I gave myself some attention. And so all that kind of calmed. And then there's just like this glow that started shining. It was like, I could just notice this person's like super talented and really interesting and just like a gorgeous, you know, like not just face, but like way of being like, there's just this energy body that was exquisite. And I could just relax into enjoying that beauty. And then, I don't know, after like 5, 10, 15 minutes, whenever it was, it kind of dawned on me like, oh, and other people have this beauty too. 
And so it was like, it primed my heart to see beauty. And then I started looking around the circle until I found beauty in the next person and the next person and the next person. And it just, it was so transformative. So that when sexual desire, physical attraction arose after that, it became this like, oh, I get to get to this part where like my heart is just open in this loving kind of gratitude, a bit of bliss. And I started to really enjoy it with my vows of celibacy, with no intention whatsoever to act upon any of it. Um, and for me that, you know, for some people that is a challenge. For me that wasn't. Um, and I felt like it grew this deep confidence in my own capacity to practice with everything. Um, because I think when I first started practicing, I know for some people, anger is the one thing that they're like, oh, I can handle everything else, but I cannot be mindful with my anger or the whatever else. And for me, I was like, I'm excited to practice in all parts of my life, but I can't imagine ever being mindful or when I'm attracted to somebody and like really hot. I just couldn't imagine it. <laughs> and it was such transformation it gave me this deep confidence um, that strengthened all of my practice. And yet as a monastic, we weren't supposed to talk about sexuality at all. Um, so I never really talked about this with anyone else. And I always felt like it was a shame because like this is really life-giving, <laughs> very different from what was taught formally, very effective, at least for me. Um, so that's part of, part of like, oh, I still want to be able to share about this. And not that it's the one way, but it is a way that's been really powerful. And this last little bit of the talk is that two and a half years ago, I disrobed, um, which has meant many, many things. And I didn't even know if I'd want to try dating at all. I was both happy and celibacy happy with my practices that I developed, not really sure how to, I'm just not sure about so many things. And after some months, it's like, well, you know, it's a pandemic. There are many forms of isolation um, that had gotten to be too much, uh, as well as, you know, I did really miss affection and touch. I definitely felt the lack um, of that connection. And you know, I, I had tried dating apps for the first time <laughs> and, uh, you know, went on a few dates um, and eventually did date someone about a year after, um, we were together about six months or so and, oh my goodness, I was still the, I was not just the 20, the 33 year old, 34 year old that I was when I ordained. I was 16 again. Um, all my attachment wounds, all of my like wounded teenager, all the excitement, but also like deep insecurity, deep fear of rejection um, were like so present because I hadn't been practiced. That realm had just gone dormant. Not my inner working with the desire, but the actual relational experience. I, I wasn't, I was relating with people all the time, but that kind of relating had just been, been um, dampened. Sorry, I have to um, check something. Okay. I set a timer so that I don't stay up on the internet net for too late, but <laughs> it's now staying on. Um, yeah, it was deeply humbling. And actually I've spoken with a lot of former monastics who said the same thing. They're like, wow, when I disrobed a lot of my part, my life and myself and my, my inner workings had like changed deeply through monastic experience. But when it came to dating, man, I was the same teenager, 20 some year old that I used to be. And you know, there's a lot of working with those parts has, I think, gone a lot faster than, <laughs> um, but where we were starting at was just like so raw and uh, 
it was kind of shocking. So that now in this part of my life, um, my work and my way of practicing with this third precept is to actually not suppress desire. Because I realized that for all the heart opening and all the the beautiful aspects that I, I still deeply appreciate um, and still use those practices, there's always this little twinge of like, oh, desires are rising, have to get rid of that. <laughs> um, that, the, the, you know, very, very subtle, but it's still aversion, right? And so we don't want to be stuck in the craving, but we don't want to be stuck in aversion either. And I've been noticing just these, that's more of an issue for me these days, especially I was on a retreat this summer and, you know, was very attracted to somebody and I could feel it, the like, it, the desire arising and then that like, nope. And part of it was like, you can't have that. This is a retreat. You're a monastic. Oh, I'm, I'm not a monastic anymore. And yes, it's a retreat. I'm not going to like go hit on somebody. Um, but I could feel, I could feel the, that, shh, nope, nope. And so I'm learning to, f to also recognize attachment system that I think in, you know, there's like the attachment styles that have been named through different psychological sort of theories and modalities, anxious attachment, avoidant attachment, secure attachment. But the fact is that we all have a system that it attaches in certain ways. And I've been able to start feeling that the part that's going, I need to connect to this person because it's really important or else like, I'm going to die if I'm not connected to this person. I'm going like, oh, Oh yeah, that's my attachment. That's that's like deep limbic system stuff. That's that's telling me that this is like super important. That I think is often what is in the Dharma gets sort of conflated because it's very old language before these theories existed, of like being being caught in desire and doing things that are, you know, being able to harm yourself and others when you get caught in that. And so again, I, I see like if there's any aversion to it, I, it's actually not helpful for my practice. But when I can go, oh, there's something in me that like wants and and loves getting this kind of attention that I'm getting from this person, or the way this person's smiling at me, or or this particular set of characteristics that's resonating in my heart as something that's like really important and wanted. I may or may not get it from this person, but oh, I can learn about what my heart wants and and needs. Um, so I'm doing a lot of work at not repressing desire. Um, I'm also seeing that I find it easier to tune into the cosmic love than the particulars. Um, when I stay on the realm of like wanting to generate metta for everybody, or when I was in the monastery, like serve people and um, and find something good it was great and now that i'm like looking for friends that i just want to hang out with it's a lot harder to find people that i like <laughs> to be around or that that like there can be some desire and sexual interest but then also like personality i'm like am i just really judgmental or i think in large part i'm just so out of out of practice a lot of things or out i've you know i've lived in a very different way for a long time um and so there's this tension between the universal love and the particular human love that I haven't been practicing with. And that needs work too. Um, so that's all like a lot of words and a lot of thoughts and experiences. And um, just to say, like when I was dating last year, there were some moments where I was like, we are kissing and we are full on going at it. And I am not feeling any craving. I'm just enjoying this. And this is phenomenal. Um, so I really, I really do have a sense that it is possible to have this like 
engagement in sensuality and sexuality that is not caught in craving, but it's also really hard and not usually what happens. And I don't think that we even need to be judging ourselves by those standards, but it was a phenomenal experience to go like, oh, yeah, I know what craving feels like and I know what absence of craving feels like. And this is, there, there's just no craving right now. Whoa! <laughs> um, and just letting myself be seen and not being so afraid of the rejection because that has been such a long pattern that I think made it very easy to take on celibacy for a decade. Um, so there's, there's just, there's always so much growth and I'm definitely like not stuck in the form of the precepts, but the spirit of the training of the mindfulness training, how can I be non harm towards myself in my, in my sexuality and sensuality as well as to others? It's really where I'm working and, and living with right now. And so this is my take on querying the third precept. <laughs> Um, that I hope you also can see the reflection of like all of the trainings can have a, an evolution to them. We practice them differently depending upon the different times of our lives. They look very different and yet um, can be so rich and so uh, it's like just beautiful doors into engaging our whole lives as a field of awakening beautiful and wonderful um and yeah i hope that at least some parts of this have been helpful or resonate with something that you could use because not just telling stories to tell stories i really <laughs> i i've never heard people talk about all these things i did hear some really good conversation between llama rod owens and spring washam in their podcast um which I can put into the chat. I um, can't remember what their podcast is called. Um, but it's very rare to hear an open and honest conversation about this. And so I also just feel like this just needs to happen. There just needs to be more <laughs> and more <laughs> and more um, so that we can all find ways to practice that lead to genuine liberation. Um, cause it's, I mean, sexuality and sensuality, the reason we don't also talk about it is that it's, it's not only hard, there's like so much trauma in our sensuality, our sexuality, our relations. Um, so it's really important that we learn good ways to use this energy because it can also be so healing and so liberating, so powerful. So thank you so much for your listening. Um, I hope that we will open into some rich conversation, but first I want to just give us about 10 minutes to, to sit with this, to let it integrate. I'll just say a few words to guide us in, and then we'll just have some silence. And, and part of the first practice of like tuning into this, just this hum of life force. I think our sexuality, our sensuality is an expression of life force. Um... So you might want to just spend the next 10 minutes tuning into your own sense of life force directly, indirectly connected to sexuality and sensuality. And also maybe just reflect your own journey with ethical trainings if that has been part of your life. And if it hasn't, just considering that possibility. Um, so again, I'll sound the bell.
Tuning into this moment, how is it right now? Body, heart, mind, stream. And now, how is it? And now, how is it? When mind, when attention gets hooked into stories and thoughts and ideas, can there be a little spaciousness? Noticing what gets us caught, what excites us, and then returning to this ground of simple present moment awareness.
Thank you for your practice and again for your attention. And soon we will have space for conversation, reflections. Um, I think I did already put into the chat the link for the um, podcast that I mentioned, which we'll also put into the, sh the video notes. But I also did find uh, a Dharma talk by Aya Soma, who's part of the Empty Cloud community in New Jersey, um, about the sutra, a sutta, sources of what does sexual misconduct even mean. So if you're the type of person who likes to get into the nitty gritty of, of the scriptural details, there you go, because that's that's not my forte, but I think it's also important and interesting if, if that is um, one of the ways you like to look at these things. Um, for the most part, the Buddha had fairly little to say about lay people's sex lives. He mostly didn't care, is my understanding. Um, it, there's a lot said in monastic life because of all these rules. Um, and then there's a lot about um, not having sex to, with someone who is married to someone else, who is, um, who would be like illegal <laughs> to, to be with, um, which today we would think of like, you know, someone who's underage or someone, you know, who's committed to another person um, is the very, very, very short version. But if you're interested, um, she's got a great talk, lots of good references. Um, so I forgot to share that, but I'll put that link into the, sh the video notes too. So um, I think we can stop the recording at this point. Thanks, Julie.